Good afternoon and welcome to Heritage Ohio's first webinar of the 2014 season. Uh, very excited to kick off our, uh, our, our webinar series uh, this month with Jeff Speck. Um, but first wanted to cover a couple things. Uh, this is the uh, Heritage Ohio webinar series and uh, Heritage Ohio is Ohio's official historic preservation and Main Street organization. At uh, Heritage Ohio, we, we foster economic development and sustainability through preservation of historic buildings, revitalization of downtowns and neighborhood commercial districts, and promotion of cultural tourism. So uh, we ask that all of you, uh, it's through your, um, through your donations, your membership, and, and your support that we are able to host these webinars and able to, to uh, provide the services that we do. So we thank you all for, for attending today. Um, a couple bits of housekeeping. Um, First off, if, if you run into any problems during the webinar, uh, if there's any issues with, with uh, lag time or, or things freeze up, 99% um, of the problems can just be solved by shutting down the, the software uh, and logging back in. Uh, that usually fixes everything. So, so don't panic too much. Just uh, shut it down and open it back up. Uh, if you have questions throughout, uh, you should see over on the, uh, the control panel uh, that there's a place to ask questions. So please feel free to, to put your questions in there and uh, uh, we will read those to, uh, um, to the speaker at the end of the session or at the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any problems, also feel free to put those in there if, you're, if, you, um, if people aren't able to hear the webinar or if you can't see or something, if, if there's something going on, uh, please type those in there and we'll see if we can address those. But um, uh, otherwise, we should be in pretty good shape. So uh, uh, again, feel, you know, um, feel free to, to let us know if there's anything wrong on, on your end. But uh, with that, uh, I'm very pleased to announce uh, our, our speaker today, our presenter for the webinar, uh, Jeff Speck. Uh, Jeff is a city planner and architectural designer who, through writing, lectures, and built work, advocates internationally for smart growth and sustainable design. As director of design at the National Endowment for the Arts from 2003 to 2007, he oversaw the Mayor's Institute on City Design and created the Governor's Institute on Community Design, a federal program that helps state governors fight suburban sprawl. Prior to joining the endowment, Mr. Speck spent 10 years as director of town planning at Dwayne uh, Plater Zerbrick and Company, a leading practitioner of new urbanism, where he led or managed more than 40 of the firm's projects. He is the co-author of Suburban Nation, The Rise of Sprawl and the Decline of the American Dream, as well as the Smart Growth Manual. He serves as a contributing editor to Metropolis Magazine and on the Sustainability Task Force of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. His new book, Walkable City, How Downtown Can Save America One Step at a Time, is now available in print, digital, and audio format. With that, I'm very happy to uh, announce uh, uh, and have Jeff Speck here. So I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Well, thank you. And um, I think I can say that Ohio leads the state well, let's say Ohio leads, leads the nation in Jeff Speck webinars, because I've only done two webinars. They've both been this past month or two, and they've both been for Ohio organizations. So the last one was for the Ohio um, American Planning Association, um, but I should say it had more of a national audience. In any case, I'm not sure what's in the water there, but I'm uh, happy to do it. This is a talk that can be a two-hour talk. Uh, I've given it in 15 minutes as a TED Talk, which isn't yet online. I have a different TED Talk online if, you're, if you'd like to see a TED Talk by me. Um, but this is a talk that I'll be giving today in a little bit under an hour. And uh, I'll try to leave some time at the end before 2 o'clock for a Q&A. Uh, bear with me. This is a very unusual thing to be giving a talk to a bunch of people who you can't see or hear. Um, so I'm going to do my best to imagine that you're there and plow on as if I have an audience, which I suppose I do. So uh, I call this talk Planning for Walkability, um, but I also call it Planning for Walkability in the sense that um, both uses of the, of the term, we are working to make our cities more walkable, but my particular focus has been the tool of planning and what we can do as planners or by people who effectively act as planners, which most Main Street people do, um, to make our cities more walkable. I'm not going to go through the long form introduction I usually give for myself and I appreciate the introduction that you heard. Um, 
but I'll jump right into the interface that I've been having with cities these days and, and a lot of the cities I go to uh, I'm brought to by this group called CEOs for Cities and I mentioned CEOs for Cities to, to, dis to discuss I think the value of planning and the value of design as it relates to making our cities more successful. CEOs for Cities is the type of nonprofit that cities hire to answer the question how can we be more successful? What can we do to attract young talent? How can we thrive socially but especially economically? And CEOs for Cities brings me in and others like me because they realize actually that a successful city um, needs to do two things. It's like designing a house. You want to know what's in the house, like how many bedrooms, but you also want the house to, to look and feel good and work well. And so half of it is program and half of it is design. Programming has to do with how big your convention center is, um, if you have one, what sports facilities you might have, what events you might have, like Art Prize in Grand Rapids, which is transforming people's perception of Grand Rapids. But the other half is just the plain old design of the spaces between the buildings, the streets, the squares, the plazas, if you have them, um, to attract people to them. And that's something that we've gotten so wrong for so long in our cities that we need to pay special attention to it. So my practice has kind of evolved around this realization as a planner who, you know, I've accidentally become this walkability guy, but in fact I was, you know, I used to be what they called a neo-traditionalist in the sense that I was working to replace suburban sprawl with traditional or traditionally organized towns like uh, I learned from my mentors, Andre Stuani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg. Um, and then I became known as a new urbanist, as they did. Um, and, you know, we've called ourselves for many years just urban designers and people focused on good urban design. But we, I've at least reframed the argument under this new term of walkability because that seems to offer an entree into a lot of conversations and, frankly, opportunities for making change. Uh, that were not obvious or uh, available before. And in my experience at the NEA, working with many, many American mayors, and then subsequently with CEOs for Cities and others, I learned that walkability was, in fact, the um, intellectual framework that many mayors and city leaders were using as a way to both kind of judge the success of their city, you know, do we have street life as an indicator of a city's success, but also understanding that it's a necessary aspect of a successful city. Now I should say, when I, just, when I say city, I'm speaking much more generally of cities, towns, municipalities, and when I talk about cities or downtowns, I'm really talking about any place in America that has the potential to be truly walkable. I think you'll understand by the end of this talk if you don't already, that um, in almost all cases those places are pre-war places. They are the places that were designed before we reinvented design around the presumption of universal automobile use and they're the places that tend to have mixed use in them already as I will describe but that please uh, understand because I know many of you are from smaller communities and um, uh, you know, locations where there may just be one street that is the opportunity here, that any neighborhood that has that kernel of mixed use and that kernel of pre-war development uh, has the same potential to be a walkable place if it's not walkable already. Um, and I think you'll find that some of the best practices I'm going to talk about today are already uh, in place in your community. Many aren't you'll find that some are appropriate to yours and some aren't appropriate to yours given the size and scale of your community but I, I think you you will have a good sense as to which are applicable and which are not but most of them are applicable in most places um, so I kind of reoriented my practice around this question if a vital place is full of pedestrians how do you get people to walk and the answer in my book um, Walkable City which I encourage you all to to read uh, is uh, 
a hierarchy I learned from my new urbanist colleagues um, that I'll be discussing in theory and then um, showing you how we implement that a bit in practice. And the theory says, and what I call my general theory of walkability, that the place that you need to offer four things simultaneously. Each of these is necessary. Each is not. Each is not alone sufficient. Um, there needs to be a reason to walk, which has to do with the proper balance of uses, including parking. The walk has to be safe, and more importantly, it has to feel safe, because that's what determines whether people are walking or not. The walk has to be comfortable, and the walk has to be interesting. And this list is created with an understanding that most walkers in America these days are walkers by choice and that most communities in America are principally driving communities but it's possible to create pedestrian culture if you can offer a walking experience which is as good or better than the driving experience and the only way to do it frankly is to satisfy all four of these criteria at once so these four, four criteria will be the framework of my talk today so the reason to walk <clears throat> brings us back to the formative victory of the planning profession and a uh, story that Andres Duani used to call just the story of planning. And we talked about how he talked about it, how in the, in the uh, 19th century the, um, the great victory of the planning professions in these you know, sooty, dark cities was to separate the housing from the dark satanic mills and when the planners separated the housing from the mills of course lifespan and of course they weren't called planners at the time but it was the beginning of the profession and lifespans increased dramatically uh, immediately and they were the planners were hailed as heroes and have been trying to repeat that experience ever since and that's the onset which was uh, the onset of single use zoning which was then thanks to Ohio again uh, was became the law under Euclidean zoning um, and the fact remains that most places where I show up if I'm showing up to plan a piece of land which has not yet been developed it tends to have a plan on it already that looks something like this that guarantees <clears throat> a non-walkable environment because you have large areas of single use separated from each other and so the first aspect of the useful walk is simply having the best balance of all different uses in close proximity to each other and of course the most walkable places in America are the places where it's not you know I was an art history major so I say you know you have a choice between a Rothko and a Seurat Seurat being the pointillist and Seurat is much more walkable and this map of Manhattan even is a bit misleading because the red zones are mixed use vertically so uh, every single lot typically has a mix of uses on it. So, um, uh, you know, this is what we've been building since 1950. Um, and I tell people, you know, this is the American dream for many people, but you have to understand that it's a two-part deal. You know, this comes with this. And if you separate things from each other and reconnect them only with automotive transportation, then the, it's the highway system uh, that becomes so overburdened, um, often to bizarre extremes, um, and we all know the experience of occupying these places. This is not Photoshop. This is uh, outside of Orlando. Walter Kulash took this picture. Um, the experience of being a driver in these places we know very well. Being a pedestrian can be equally challenging. And um, the epidemiologists like Dick Jackson and, and um, Howie Frumkin have been showing this slide now for some time. And of course the big lesson that they've been telling us recently, and I talk about this quite a bit in my book, is that of course we've become a moribund society and of course we have obesity rates that are through the ceiling and so many other health challenges because you know when you don't think twice about designing an environment in which it's appropriate to drive to the parking lot to take the escalator to get on the treadmill to walk, um, you're going to have a um, less healthy society. So. Um, comparing those models, so I, I should say that this is an issue particularly as it pertains to the design of new places but when you're looking at the design of existing places and how to make them better then you ask this question what is missing or underrepresented in any neighborhood in which you want walkability to happen and in most places I work which aren't the Chicago's, the San Francisco's, 
<coughs> the Boston's, the Washington's. In the typical smaller cities in which I work, what's typically underrepresented in these downtown areas is, is housing, is still housing. And it's only by adjusting the housing to working balance that you can optimize the amount of walkability, uh, walking that's going to happen, and biking. For example, I just finished a project in Boise. Boise has a jobs to housing balance in its center city of 43 to 1. Once you bring the housing in, the other things tend to get better. The retail gets much better when it has around the clock users. Recreational and park um, facilities improve. And eventually the schools do get better, maybe 15 years later. But it's bringing in that fuller mix of uses in the form of housing first that tends to uh, cause a more robust, comprehensive mix down the road. <clears throat> the separate question I'd like to ask is, you know, what is underpriced and overrepresented? And in most places, that's parking. Now, here's where I do my five-minute version of Don Shoup. But for those of you who haven't read The High Cost of Free Parking, it's, I think, 723 pages, three and a half pounds. I had jury duty, so I read it, and I dedicate a chapter to it in my book, which he edited. And... Um, He's the first guy in America to really study parking in the sense of how can parking work, how can parking design, parking planning, and parking policy work to the benefit of our cities? Not just how can we provide enough parking or what amount of parking we should we provide, but what's a strategy for parking that makes cities thrive? And he essentially has this three-legged stool. The first leg is to remove the on-site parking requirement. This is a this is ironically the place in Detroit where Henry Ford invented the automobile, but it was an opera house, and now, thanks to requirements for parking, it's a parking garage. But the on-site parking requirement, uh, as we said in Suburban Nation many years ago, is probably the single greatest killer of urbanism and walkability in American cities for so many reasons that I won't get into. Um, but he makes it very clear that the proper way to handle parking if people are to, if downtowns are to thrive, is collectively is not to ask each merchant to provide parking on, this, on their own site, but ideally to have each merchant who would be paying to build parking to contribute that money instead to a collective fund that allows parking to be provided in a consolidated way. The second step, <clears throat> the second leg of his stool, is pricing parking properly to reflect demand. And here you have one of the earliest downtown parking plans that was done in the U.S this one for Redwood City, California, um, that shows how from red to orange to yellow, the price changes based on a goal. And the goal you know, is congestion-based pricing. The goal is an 85% occupancy of every curb. So you have one empty space per block face on each block. The parking meter was invented by merchants to help merchants. It is inevitably the merchants who fight you when you try to do this, when you try to raise the price of parking. Now, I should say, I've worked in some places where to achieve the 85% occupancy, we've actually reduced the price of parking. The message here isn't to charge more for parking. The message is to charge the right amount for parking. And the right amount for parking is the one that's going to maximize turnover, is the price that's going to allow Daddy Warbucks to always find a space near the furrier, and that is going to... Um, have people who have less money to spend parking further away and people who have more money to spend parking and who are in more of a hurry because they're wealthy <laughs> to be parking uh, in the, or believe they're in more of a hurry to be parking closer to the things that they want to buy. And so the merchants always fight this. The merchants are actually wrong to fight this. Um, and Don Shoup outlines in wonderful detail how whenever the merchants, well, in the studies that he provides, whenever the merchants have fought an increase in parking price and then the price has come to pass, the very next day the merchants turned around and said, thank you, we were wrong, thank you for defeating us. But often another step is needed to win the buy-in and also to the benefit of these areas, to win the buy-in of the merchants. And that step is the third leg in the stool, which is the parking benefit district, which is essentially to say all the extra money we get from charging you more to park, if it is more, in this neighborhood, all that extra money is going to go to your 
sidewalks, your trees, your storefronts, your rear alleyways. And in Pasadena, <clears throat> these beautiful courtyards uh, that you find behind all the buildings in succession of, of walkable spaces were once rear alleys, but the parking revenues paid to make them beautiful. And of course, you end up in this virtuous cycle of people, of the businesses doing better, the money coming in, the place being improved and more becoming more beautiful, more people coming in, the business is doing yet better, more money coming in, et cetera. And that's why South Pasadena has done so well. I tell the story of South Pasadena versus Westwood, California, in my book, which is Shoup's Tale of Two Cities, where he documents how two cities were neck and neck, and one raised the price of parking and one lowered it. And um, now, basically, Pasadena eats Westwood's lunch just because of that one factor. I realize in many of your communities, this, communities, this is a very sensitive issue, <clears throat> and perhaps you shouldn't be charging for parking. But if there is a parking crowding problem, you should be charging for parking enough to stop the circling. What is valuable and being wasted? This applies more to the larger cities among the people listening. Um, and chances are that is your structured parking lots. This is a very interesting story. Lowell, Massachusetts, I was called in to do a master plan. They'd already made great gains in Lowell, but they had millions of square feet of industrial, early industrial era lofts that they were trying to fill with housing, as you see accomplished here. And the problem was the banks, as banks do, were requiring that parking be provided in association with the new housing and that was driving the price of housing up. And what the city did was to identify the downtown parking structures, and Lowell happened to have five of them, that were partly empty during the day, large, sorry, yeah, largely full, but partly empty during the day and largely empty over the, uh, overnight, and assigning those in official letters, assigning these parking structures to developers and saying, you can bring this to your bank and say that this parking lot is going to serve your building. And that's a trick a number of uh, and so, you know, the housing is filled up. That's a trick that a number of cities are using. <clears throat> I was most recently in Hamilton, Ohio, and on their main street, even, they're using this trick to do some residential development right on the main street. Um, that's the first category. Second category is the safe walk, which is the biggest category. It's what most people talk about when they talk about walkability. It's about 100 moving parts. Most cities get maybe half of them wrong. The first is block size. And uh, the smaller the block, the more walkable the city and the safer the city. This is Portland with its famous walkability and its famously 200 foot long blocks. This is Salt Lake City. See the scale in the lower le left? Same scale. It's like a different planet, right? Famously unwalkable, famously 600 foot blocks in Salt Lake City because a 200-foot block city can basically be a two-lane city. Most of the streets in Portland are two lanes, or maybe four. In Salt Lake City, you know, a 600-foot block city is essentially a six-lane city. And the experience of being on these streets is, is very unpleasant. It's also more dangerous. Look at the average block size of these different cities across California. Look at the fatal crashes not on highways. As you double the block size, you almost quadruple the number of fatal crashes in these systems. So block size is the first thing. Now, I think the message here, obviously, you've got the bones that you've got in your city, but you need to reject the impulse that many cities still have um, to mega block, to combine blocks together, to remove streets from the network, because it is this porous network of small streets that allows each street to be small. The next, of course, is the number of lanes and the discussion I always have everywhere I go of induced demand. And induced demand applies to highways, but it also applies to the streets in your city. And what the experience of induced demand teaches us is that this, and forgive me if you've seen these before, these really important charts have been floating around for 30 years, but I still show them because most places get it wrong. But you know, this is ideal traffic planning. You anticipate a growth in a number of cars on a street, you widen the street, thinking you will absorb that growth. But of course, what happens is people adjust their behavior. There are all sorts of reasons for this. 
The um, principal one, not to get into it too deeply, is that in congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. And so when you remove the constraint, people adjust their behavior and drive more. And we repeat that experience over and over again. So, you know, this is well known. This, I ripped this out of Newsweek magazine when I discovered it, hardly an esoteric publication says, today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually makes traffic worse. To which my response was, who are these engineers and may I please meet some of them? Because most places that I go to work, um, they may say that they understand induced demand, but they make decisions every day, every day, as if they don't understand induced demand. I should say there is a small cadre now, really a small army, of traffic engineers who do understand it and do preach it and who I learned this from. But it's very important when you're working in communities to make sure that everyone's starting on the same page and understands this phenomenon that, you know, oh, you have to widen that street because cars are coming, and then you widen it, and the cars come, and the traffic engineer says, see, I told you so, but in fact, it is the widening. In congested systems, a widening will create just more lanes of congestion. This is well known, well documented. This paper was presented at the Paris School of Economics many years ago. It's not been uh, refuted. I have no idea what this means, but it all adds up to this, which essentially says, as you increase capacity, very quickly you end up with the same amount of congestion because more people use the road. Typically within four years, you have a full um, increase to absorb the entire new capacity. This is from the Surface Transportation Policy Project. Metro areas that invested heavily in road capacity expansion fared no better in easing congestion than metro areas that did not. Trends in congestion show that areas that exhibited greater growth in lane capacity spent roughly 22 billion more on road construction than those that didn't, yet ended up with slightly higher congestion costs per person, wasted fuel, and travel delay. Interestingly, the opposite seems to also happen. This is, again, a discussion for the larger communities, but there's something that I call reduced demand, which has to do with what happens when you remove a highway. And it applies principally to highway spurs. If you have a highway running through the middle of your city that's connecting Canada to Mexico, um, this is a little bit of a trickier discussion. But if you have a long spur that's dumping off into your city, like the Embarcadero was in San Francisco, or the Central Freeway was in San Francisco, that when you remove it, as happened after the Loma Prieta, Prieta earthquake damaged the road, when you remove it, <coughs> and everybody's been pre predicting this Carmageddon, in fact, the Carmageddon doesn't happen. Um, you have to take proper measures, like you know, putting a proper boulevard in its place and then introducing transit to absorb the trips. All these things are very helpful. These streetcars in San Francisco actually carry more people per day than this highway did. Um, but the trips just go away. Now the interesting thing is that the increase in real estate value that happens when you change this neighborhood to this neighborhood is so dramatic that you could tear down plenty of perfectly healthy highways right away and pay for them. Pay for the teardowns and the boulevard replacements with the um, excess tax that you would receive from increased property values in the subsequent years. Now that isn't likely to happen in most cities, but many cities have spurs that are reaching the end of their useful life and will have to be replaced at tremendous cost where it's much, much cheaper to replace them like this. You know, trees are cheaper than bridges. And so there's certainly a great argument to be made for replacing those with surface boulevards. This is something I like to show because it's just so easy. Um, of course, anywhere where you can reduce the number of lanes, you're bringing travel speeds down and you're making streets safer for all users. This is the classic um, unpleasant condition of a, um, oh, if, if you'll excuse me for one minute, I'm going to put you on pause because I'm going to answer the door so that it doesn't keep ringing. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm, I'm, I'm here alone today. This is the classic road diet. Um, 
classic road diet where you have a four laner which is fundamentally unsafe and inefficient. It's unsafe because as you can see here the white car stops for you, the green car doesn't and you get t-boned. Um, but it's also rather inefficient because the speeding lane is also the turning lane and that inefficiency creates an ideal kind of road diet where you do this. And by losing one lane of traffic and converting it to bike lanes or to a flank of parallel parking, and by the way, you don't need to rebuild the curbs. You can just take the streets you've got and restripe them, which is the kind of work that I'm doing in most cities. Um, you end up with a street that's much safer. I should say for a lot of main streets, this is something that's being done. And the center turn lane also becomes a lane for storing trucks during deliveries. Um, so it's a nice solution for a four-lane Main Street. So this is no surprise that the injury accidents drop precipitously. But this is the surprise. Here's my chart of 17 road diets provided by ACOM. And if you look at the throughput of the road before and after, actually on average it went up slightly. So you have three-lane roads handling as much traffic, if not more, than these inefficient four-lane roads. And so um, it's a win-win-win. It's more pleasant to walk on. You potentially can add bike facilities or parking lanes. Uh, it's safer, and you don't lose any capacity. Now, let's talk about one place which is Oklahoma City, which is a city that was oversized. And this is the condition that I find, I mean oversized in terms of its roadways. This is a condition I find most places I visit. You know, you make the induced demand argument, you give the best argument you can, and then you say, all right, but let's not try to reduce the, the let's not try to reduce the capacity of any of your streets. And let's just presume that you don't believe me <clears throat> about induced demand. What can we do to help anyway? And I was called into Oklahoma City because it was named the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country by Prevention Magazine. And I did a walkability study. And it was very interesting what we found. We found, you know, Portland's on the left, Oklahoma City's on the right. We found that the blocks weren't that big. We said, oh, you've got almost Portland-sized blocks. So why do you have Salt Lake City-sized streets? And it turned out that this, there was a huge mismatch between the cars per day on these streets and the size of the streets. And they had had, the, the, as they said, we had our very own Robert Moses <clears throat> who would widen it first and ask questions later. And so if you zoom into this traffic counts map, this is downtown Oklahoma City, you have traffic counts of 11,000, 9,000, 6,000, 4,000, 3,000 on these streets that are four to six lanes wide. And we know that two lanes can handle 10,000 cars per day. So this is an extreme version of what I find in most cities I visit, that there are many streets and at least certain key streets that have more lanes than the amount of traffic on them would actually demand. So these were designated arterials of four to six lanes in the brand new downtown plan that a very good planning firm had done for them without, without questioning any of the number of lanes downtown. So Hudson Avenue, you know, 8,000 cars per day, it only needed two lanes and it had six. So fortunately, Oklahoma City was rebuilding, well, let me just say this, they were, they were building a 50-story building in the heart of their downtown that was generating a huge tax increment. And they were wondering what to spend it on. And we convinced them to spend it on rebuilding all of the streets in a 50-block downtown core. And as I'll show you, this is stuff you can achieve just with striping. But they said, no, no, we're going to rebuild it from building face to building face entirely. Um, and my job was to design essentially the curb to curb, to redesign the curb to curb of every street. And what this redesign did was double the amount of on-street parking. And by the way, according to the National Trust, 15 years ago, according to the National Trust, every on-street parking space is worth $10,000 in revenue to a local business. So we doubled the amount of on-street parking. And we introduced a comprehensive cycling network where there hadn't been one at all. So a typical street goes from this to this. It's about half built now. The half of the work has been done. 
Here's a five laner that had to stay uh, because of its importance in the grid, had to stay as four lanes plus turn lane, but we put in a median, and there was room because the lanes were so wide to actually include bicycle lanes as well. Um, and this is just a picture from someplace I was recently. Um, I can find streets like this in almost every city I go to. <laughs> um, One-way streets, such as this one, <clears throat> are also bad for walking and they're bad for business. Not a one-lane, one-way like you find in, you know, in the residential streets of Manhattan. Uh, often not a two-lane, one-way if, if they're small enough lanes, like you might find in Portland in some cases. But three-lane or more one-ways, and sometimes two-lane one-ways, the fact that there's no opposing traffic to slow cars down, the fact that whatever lane you're in, the other lane seems faster, and you begin to jockey as a driver, you get into this road racer mentality, um, they're just, they just tend to cause cars to go faster and to drive more aggressively. They're worse for business in the sense that they distribute energy unevenly. So, for example, you know, people tend to shop on the way home from work, but not on the way to work. And many one-way conversions that happened in the 60s and 70s um, turned shopping streets into streets in which people only drove on them on the way to work, killing the businesses. The classic conversation that was written up was in Governing Magazine by Alan Ehrenholtz, who's a pretty prolific writer on these issues. <clears throat> and he told the story of Vancouver, Washington, where they did so many things to improve their main street without any impact on revenues to businesses. And then they finally bit the bullet and made it two-way when it had been one-way. And the number of, um, of shoppers basically doubled. And the head of the Chamber of Commerce of Vancouver will tell you, they tell you in this article, never have a one-way street for shopping. Now, there are obvious exceptions to that rule, and every shopping street should not necessarily be two-way. But if you have a one-way main street and shops aren't doing well, then chances are it should be a two-way main street. Here's an example of East Broad Street in Savannah that was compiled by the architect Christian Sotil. It was converted one-way in 69. Very quickly, 64% of the business addresses went away. In 1990, it was revert reverted to two-way because of a school that was renovated, and almost immediately a 50% gain in business addresses. And city after city has this sort of data. So <clears throat> another typical city that I work in, uh, Cedar Rapids, had an all four-lane, half one-way downtown, lovely small blocks, about 250 by 250. This is the grid. And here's the proposal for Cedar Rapids, which has just been approved by the engineers, turning it to an all two-way, all two-lane system, which allows us to dramatically increase the amount of on-street parking, turning a lot of parallel parking into angle parking, and to dramatically improve the bicycling network without spending a penny on construction. They were considering spending three million dollars to fix five blocks of one street. And I convinced them instead to spend much less than that restriping this entire downtown core. And by the way, of the 20, sorry, of the 17 signals, of the 17 street lights, stop lights in this grid, we're now able to replace 11 of them with four-way stop signs because the traffic volumes are so low that there's no reason to have signals. And of course, that's so much better for pedestrians and bicyclists. Everyone's having eye contact at every intersection. People are driving much more slowly. People aren't rushing to make the light. And you get through the downtown on average faster with stop signs because while you must stop at each intersection, you're never sitting and waiting. So this is in the process of being um, implemented now. Then there's the width of the lanes. Uh, the famous image where Andres Duany says, you know, the lanes have become so wide that you can see the curvature of the earth. And the fact that the standards have changed, this subdivision from the 60s and this one from the 80s, look at the width of the streets shot from the same height 
the streets have just gotten fatter and fatter, even to the degree that, you know, my old neighborhood in South Beach in Miami, <clears throat> when it came time to rebuild Espanola Way, because it wasn't draining properly, the new standards kicked in and we lost half our sidewalk and all of our street trees because for some reason this perfectly functioning street no longer met the code. When the street is wider, people drive faster. You know, a 10-foot lane is a 30-mile-an-hour lane. A 12-foot lane is a 70-mile-an-hour lane. And many cities in which I work insist on 12-foot lanes downtown as if they want to see 70-mile-an-hour speeds downtown. And that's simply not smart. And this one report says that increased lane widths are responsible for approximately 900 additional traffic fatalities per year. We are only slowly beginning to tr convince the traffic engineers that wider lanes are more dangerous, but we're certainly able to convince their bosses who have common sense to work with as opposed to uh, an incorrect um, theory that they learned in school. Citizens understand this. They demand narrower streets. Portland does, did so many things well, but one thing they did well was to introduce a skinny street program in its residential neighborhoods. And for residential streets, single-family streets, a 12-foot lane handles traffic in two directions. For a local street that is not bearing the burden of commuting traffic or um, you know, high-density housing, for a local street with single-family houses on it, 12 feet of pavement is all you need when there's a parking lane because people can pull over in the parking lane to let other cars pass. 12 feet is all you need for a very safe residential two-way street and then you add the parking. So you have streets like this, two-way streets that we built for the developer Vince Graham in Ion outside of Charleston, South Carolina, his development. 22-foot uh, right-of-way, very small, 22-foot curb-to-curb, very small right-of-way. He shows this at conferences, Vince Graham does. He, he, quotes this famous philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life, and this plays very well in the South. ITE has approved these standards. This is an approved practice of the Institute of Traffic Engineers, Transportation Engineers, and now recently endorsed by the Federal Highway Administration for downtown commercial streets now, not skinny residential streets, but there's no reason why you need to have a main street where the lanes are wider than 10 feet, or if you want 11 because there's a bus, go ahead, right? But 10 feet is plenty, 8-foot parking lanes. This is the new standard, and there's no reason to have anything wider. Bicycling, I like to describe as the greatest revolution currently underway in only some American cities. Portland, Oregon was just like the rest of America back in the 80s and they invested a limited amount a couple million dollars a year for many years in biking and now you know I asked my friend Tom Brennan in Portland to send me some pictures of biking in Portland and he sent me these pictures and I said is this bike to work day and he said no it was Tuesday this is just a normal day in Portland because they built the infrastructure and there are plenty of examples where this isn't true but certainly when it comes to biking it is a build it and they will come phenomenon New York City has more than doubled, has, has doubled the number of bikers more than once in the past 10 years by painting these bold lanes in the streets. Even automotive cities like Long Beach, California, dramatic increase in biking with the broad painted facilities. And cities ask me, you know, should we paint them bright green? And I say, well, I don't know. I mean, do you, do you spend any money on boosterism or on billboards or on Chamber of Commerce stuff to advance the, 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 the fortunes of your city because this green stripe is a horizontal billboard that says that this is a progressive city, this is a healthy city, this is a young city, this is a city that is sustainable. And uh, that's a great message to send. This is the gold standard of bike lanes. This is the one that I ride a lot in Washington, D.C the buffered lane, and if you really want to mint cyclists in your community, this is the tool for doing it. It was a four-lane road, it became a three-lane road, <clears throat> the parallel parking was pulled off the curb 11 feet, making room for two four-foot bike lanes and a three-foot buffer. And this 
I shot this in the middle of the morning, but this lane is usually full of bikers during commute time. Uh, and you'll notice it's a two-way facility on a one-way street. <laughs> However, if instead your attitude is the same as Pasadena, who, by the way, gets some things wrong, where every lane is a bike lane, then no lane is a bike lane, and this is the only bicyclist that I met in Pasadena. Street, uh, parallel parking is an essential barrier of steel that protects the sidewalk from moving vehicles. I've been saying for years, don't bother trying to have on-street dining where you don't have parallel parking. And it was proved to me last year in Fort Lauderdale where this is the scene at happy hour where parking is allowed on the inbound curb but not on the outbound curb at the end of the day. And this is the happy hour on the inbound curb and this is the happy hour on the outbound curb. And that business has since gone out of business because no one wants to sit against cars speeding at the edge of the sidewalk. The other part of this picture, the street trees, really important. Street trees have been shown now to slow cars down. Vertical objects like trees along the road edge make, ro make cars go slower and also um, make pedestrians more protected. So, you know, we're sorry this guy hit this tree, but it protected a pedestrian at the same time. And then all the little details, the corner curb radius, the radius of curvature of the corner. You can see if it's a three foot radius or it's a 40 foot radius, determines the speed of the vehicle, determines whether you're crossing a 20 foot street or effectively a 40 foot street. Um, and uh, you know, tells you whether you're in a pedestrian environment or an automotive environment. Anything swoopy. I love this caption. This is objective journalism. Some say the entrance to city center is not inviting to pedestrians. Oh, really? This is the failing addition to the strip in Las Vegas. Um, when every aspect of the built environment says cars, of course pedestrians aren't comfortable. And the best way to say cars is with swoops. Anything geometric, anything streamform geometric, aerodynamic shapes tell you that it's a vehicular place and not a pedestrian place. And then all again, all the little details. You know, the the this is the evidence of the specialist designing the city as opposed to the generalist who needs to know all these things at once. And yes, indeed, this street will drain within 30 seconds of the 100-year flood, but this poor woman has to mount this curb every day. So that's the biggest category. Now I'm going to quickly, in, in about five minutes, zip through the last two categories, the comfortable walk and the interesting walk. The comfortable walk has to do with spatial definition and the fact that humans, like all animals, simultaneously seek both prospect and refuge. We want to know that our flanks are covered. Even as we like to see long distances, we want to feel protected. And that's in our bones from thousands and thousands of years of evolution. You can't shake it that you're most comfortable in places like this and, you know, least comfortable in places that are not well-defined. And, you know, what's the proper ratio? Is it the Renaissance ideal of one-to-one one or more medieval three-to-one? Well, most people think who talk about this that once you get above uh, a one to six, you no longer feel contained. Trees help, but basically the height to width ratio is very important. So, you know, six to one here in Salzburg is an absolute delight. And this is in a climate that's further north than Boston, right? But, um, you know, the opposite of Salzburg is Houston. <laughs> and the principal, uh, you know, enemy for that feeling of containment that you get for one second right here or for one second right there uh, is the surface parking lot up against the sidewalk edge. And this is a project you may know in Columbus that I show all around the country. Uh, ignore this, this was done later. But where you have a very walkable neighborhood, uh, or reasonably walkable, and a lot of pedestrians <coughs> by the convention center and the sports stadium that's down there. Uh, and then you have the short north. Ethnic neighborhood, great restaurants, nice little shops, but was struggling quite badly because no one was crossing the highway. Not a single pedestrian was crossing the highway um, until this was built, which is essentially a bridge that had to be rebuilt anyway, and the city gave the state an extra 1.9 million 
to get an extra 80 feet of span in width, and then they gave it to a developer who built this. And now everyone walks from neighborhood to neighborhood. And if you read the news articles, not, not the planning magazine articles, but the news articles, this bridge single-handedly um, brought back the short north, which is now the hottest neighborhood in, in Columbus. And then finally, the interesting walk, well, this is, you know, one-to-one -one is perhaps the best ratio, but, you know, this is a one-to-one -one ratio. This is the street that connects the two best hotels in Grand Rapids, um, but no one walks on it because when one side of the street is an exposed parking ramp and the other side is a conference facility that was apparently designed in admiration for the parking ramp, then um, people are just too bored to walk, right? We want active edges. And Mayor Riley in Charleston taught us it only takes 25 feet of building to hide 250 feet of parking garage. Uh, this is the Chi, I call this the Chia Pet Garage in South Beach. Same idea, just that energetic street edge. But a lot of cities I work in, you know, they have this as a requirement that you have to activate the ground floor of any new garage but they place it in, in, in areas where actually no one's going to walk anyway because there's, no, there's nothing around it. It's a horrible street. So this is an important rule, but it's a rule that you need to apply where it can make a difference and to not apply where it can't make a difference. One excuse for larger blocks is if the economics don't support parking um, structures, then you make a larger block and you have a hole in the donut which is the surface parking lot, hidden by the backs of all these buildings from the surrounding streets. So that's, a, that's, that's the list in a nutshell. That's theory. Now let's talk about practice, and I'll just show you in one second how I put this to work. And essentially it's realizing in a city that, you know, it's very expensive to do all of these things. And in fact, you have to pick your winners. And there's no point in improving walkability in places where no one's going to walk anyway. And since we need to, to achieve all of these things simultaneously, you have to find what the city can do, what the community can do, and compare it to what can be done by others. Now, in most places where I work, and I've done walkability studies in about a dozen cities in the last five years, most places where I work, what's easy to fix quickly and what the city controls is the striping of the roadway the presence of parallel parking, bike lanes, not too many travel lanes, two-way, et cetera, all the things we talked about. And what the city only controls in the long term through codes and potentially through investment are the other things, which is the buildings lining the streets. And so you find those places where there's already buildings lining streets creating useful, comfortable, and interesting walks, and you make it safe. And so in a typical walkability analysis of a place like Fort Lauderdale, the first thing I do is map these three categories in what I call a frontage quality assessment. And here you have in Fort Lauderdale, um, you know, this color is bad, right? A C is not good. <coughs> so you actually have very little area where people are likely to walk in downtown Fort Lauderdale. And so you create a primary network of walkability where the opportunity is the highest. And then, of course, you connect important things with an eye towards equity and, um, and anchors and paths. You connect the bus station. You connect the new residential neighborhoods. But essentially, you're identifying the streets that have the potential to attract walking if they're just safer than they are now, and you fix them. Then the second half, you fix them, you make them safe. So a street like this one, which actually has 15-foot travel lanes. We introduce a 10-foot travel lane, a 5-foot bike lane, and we bring the parallel parking back on both sides, for example. And then the next step is to say, okay, well, these streets are the best we've got, but they're not perfect yet, and let's look at the missing teeth in this network. And in the primary network of walkability, the lighter green, these 12 red buildings are the missing teeth. In the secondary network, which is the area that we would attack next, because it has some hope. By the way, the gray area has no hope of being walkable in our lifetimes. If you go there, you'll agree. But the green has, is our secondary network because it has some hope, the darker green. The 12 blue buildings are the infill sites in that area. 
And then you circle the wagons as a community around these sites and use tax increment financing and other tools at your disposal or the fact that the city owns a garage here that's empty all night, every night, that they can dedicate to a developer to get these sites developed. And that's essentially the strategy, although you've just heard two pages from an 80-page um, report. But that's it. Um, I hope we have a minute for Q&A. We have three minutes, but I'll stick around longer if people want. Um, and then uh, this is the most recent book I hope you will read. If you're a real junkie, I suggest that you catch up on these two. And I do love to have more followers on Twitter. So um, my Twitter handle is Jeff Speck AICP. Like most Twitter users, I judge my self-worth on how many followers I have. So I encourage you to follow me. And that's it. So thank you. And I'm not sure how this works technically, but I am sitting here and hoping to have some questions. <laughs> All right. Jeff, can you hear me? I can. All right. And speaking of Twitter, thanks very much for the uh, Twitter shout out yesterday. Uh, it was great. <laughs> Um, and we do have a, a question. Uh, we've got a question from Sarah so far, and uh, she asks if you have any pointers specifically for historic districts. Well, I mean, the historic district is typically the the part of the city that has the most likelihood of attracting this sort of street life. So, every pointer I've made today is a pointer for historic districts. <laughs> However, um, the biggest struggle, and I should say this with a largely historic preservation oriented crowd, the biggest struggle that you know historic districts face essentially is people still don't adequately understand the value of those historic buildings and are much too ready to tear them down. And to help them in that regard, although you may all may know him already, I would point you to the to the speeches and the writing of Donovan Ripkema who's got to be the leading historic preservationist, historic, I should say, preservation economist that I know. And he makes a very powerful point, which is that in competitive economies, it is the differentiated product that commands a monetary premium. And that basically, since in America, since the 50s or 60s, every place has become like every other place, and you now travel the country and there's no distinction at all among our cities as they've grown. Um, it is our historic fabric. It is these older buildings from before World War II, typically, that, that are your product differentiation. So to be a competitive place for tourism money and also just for place making um, uh, investment and you know to be a place where people want to live, it's essential that we value our older buildings um, more strongly. Well, appreciate that. We certainly couldn't agree, agree more at Heritage Ohio. We we often have uh, Donovan in at our uh, conferences and, and come in to speak, and you know we always um, carry out the the <clears throat> um, you know message that revitalization is impossible without preservation. So we uh, certainly agree. Right. Um, Next was a uh, that was a great presentation. Is it possible to have a a copy of the presentation of the PowerPoint? <clears throat> well, um, you've recorded my voice. Yes, I'm uh, happy a... to share. I'm happy to share this, but people have to understand a couple things. One, I don't own the copyright on many of these images, so there's no legal legal way to publish it. Um, additionally, obviously, the images make no sense without the text, without the audio. So I'm happy to email it to you, and you can uh, connect it to whoever you want. But I would encourage people to only watch it with the uh, audio attached. Well, then that's a good question for you. Yes, we we do record all these webinars. Are we allowed then to to uh, share that um, you know in a video form when when we're all done? Oh, so you have a video? Uh, yeah, we've recorded the webinar, and, and so I would just distribute. I would just distribute that. Okay, uh, good, good for us. Um, next, ah, thanks, Jeff. We'll go get your book for more information. Well, excellent, and and I can certainly agree with that. I know all of us in the office have have read the book and found that it really um, has helped shape our work, and, and found that uh, walkability is a great way to start any conversation when it comes to to our work in preservation and revitalization. Awesome. 
Um, next question is, uh, how do you suggest going about getting semi trucks off Main Street? Semi trucks off Main Street. <coughs> well, a lot of Main Streets that are doing very well still have semi trucks on them. Um, clearly, there are bypass strategies that I have seen cities undertake where the semis are directed around the main street and that can be effective but I find the problem is less for most people who think they have a problem with semis the real problem is the combination of semis and other traffic and a street that's just too wide and too speedy so the semi may not actually be the worst problem it could be that the geometry of the street is attracting driving behavior among all users, um, most notably semis, that's a problem. Another thing I would mention is that you know servicing, turning a, a four-lane main street to a well particularly to a two-lane main street, servicing in the presence of trucks that want to double park is always a problem, particularly in smaller communities. One solution is the three-lane solution that I described earlier, which is not ideal but to have the park trucks in the middle of the street. Another is to have designated parking zones, one per block, that you don't want them to be too big, because if they're too big, you lose the on-street parking, but a designated you know, service zone. But you know, a lot of towns, as they grow, um, need to do what cities do, which is to regulate the hours at which deliveries can occur, and to potentially even regulate the size of the trucks making the delivery. But the ideal, the optimum solution, if you have, if your economics support it, the optimum solution is to not have loading zones, but to um, have loading occur in parallel parking spaces at times when people aren't there. Great. Um, <clears throat> just comment. Uh, great information. Would like to study it further. Uh, here's a question. Uh, which type of on-street parking do you think is more advantageous, parallel parking or angled parking? You know, um, I don't have to answer that question because the size of your roadway is probably a given. And whether you can fit angle or parallel is a function of um, how much room you have. <laughs> so I think angle, you know, merch would tell you that angle is better than parallel. People like Bob Gibbs who wrote a great book called I believe Urban Retail um, will tell you that what's most important is to have parking in front. That teaser parking in front and then to have a larger cache of parking somewhere in the back but it isn't so important whether it's angle or parallel. Now the big question I often get is front end angle versus rear end angle and rear end angle is a wave that's sweeping the nation rear end angle parking is harder for drivers to do because you have to back into a constricted space as opposed to backing into the street which is not a constricted space however it's much much safer because you're backing into a static environment as opposed to backing into a dynamic environment where cars are moving most importantly front end parking is deadly to bicycles because the angle cars back out and kill bicyclists. So the, I usually tell cities who want to know, you know, front end or back end, say, well, if it's a bike route, and particularly if you're um, going to have bike lanes marked in the street, then you've got to go through the brain damage of putting the back end in. But a lot of cities <clears throat> if you don't have a community where people already know how to parallel park, people will not learn how to back in angle park. We've seen angle parking introduced in some places back in and fail because there was no tradition even of parallel parking in the communities. But, <clears throat> you know, I always say no matter what you do, people will be upset. And I always say to cities, you know, you should have back in angle parking, but I don't want to be the one who brings it to you because. <laughs> I won't be popular, um, but in most places, if there isn't a heavy bicycle load, I, I do think front end can be fine. Right. Um, 
if we have a downtown with large blocks, is it helpful to utilize alleys in some way to break up the block length? It is. You just have to be careful because the alleys are, you know, typically where all the ugly stuff goes. So, um, you know, a, a point I forgot to make in my urban triage discussion is that a lot of cities that are have reputations for being walkable actually just have one or two streets that are walkable. I mean, Greenville, South Carolina is famously walkable, and they only have one street that's worth a damn, and the rest of the streets are pretty horrible. But that street is fantastic. And so the lesson there is to start small with something that's as perfect as you can make it. And so rather than saying, let's take all our alleys and turn them into streets, let's just say, let's pick an alley and find another way to service those businesses on that alley. And let's make that one alley a fantastic, you know, complete street where everything's happening and uh, invest in it in a very limited area and see how it goes and then perhaps if it is a success expand it beyond that point but certainly you know in Salt Lake City for example there are a few little streets that break up those blocks on occasion and those are the places where you can have the two-lane street or the three-lane street that doesn't have the burden of carrying that much traffic and that's where you see the greatest potential for introducing uh, more pedestrian culture. Uh, similar question to before, um, you know, what are your thoughts on the impact of a state, ride, state route, i.e. truck traffic on a, a main street in a small town? Yeah, I mean the biggest issue with the state is that you have to then fight the state to change it. But there are many examples of communities fighting states successfully and changing their streets or fighting states that want to ruin their streets and stopping them from doing it. I give the example of Hamburg, Hamburg, New York in my book where citizens were able to, to turn a nasty uh, proposal that the state was about to implement into a very nice solution, for example. But, um, you know, most state DOTs now at least have heard of the term complete streets and they've heard of the term context sensitive design and to get them to make a change, you need to come to them as a unified community with a shared uh, goal uh, of demanding the change. Okay. All right, um, here's one. New to me is the concept of sitability. How does this relate to your concept of walkability? Uh, sitability is fantastic. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to put benches in, but you know the most advanced planners among us, like Jan Gale, are saying, you know, I don't care how many pedestrians go by, I want to know how many people are staying in the space. Um, it's kind of obvious it's that it's something we want. Retail experts like Bob Gibbs will say, well, if they're sitting, they're not shopping. <laughs> but <clears throat> I think having nice places to sit that are shaded with trees and provided with amenities like fountains can make a huge difference. A lot of cities make the mistake of putting benches with their back to traffic which doesn't work all that well. Um, the proper place for a bench typically is up against the storefront so you're like sitting on the wall of the store and anything you can do, I talk about this in my book, anything you can do to, to perceptually thicken facades so that there's kind of a place to hang out and the experience of entering is drawn out and the connection between inside and outside is blurred uh, will make your Main Street more successful. Uh, what are some of the best policies or incentives you've seen adopted in the U.S. or in other nations that have rapidly increased bike and public transit use? Uh, those are those. They're not incentives. They're investments. So you know, you you. I talk a lot about transit in my book, and it's too long a discussion to answer a question with here. Mm -hmm. uh, but the biking discussion is very clear. You know, Portland invested $60 million over 30 years in bike infrastructure. That's a lot of money, but it's $2 million a year, and it's half the cost of the one cloverleaf, highway cloverleaf they rebuilt. So it's actually a minimal cost compared to highway investment. Investment in bike infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure creates more jobs per dollar spent than investment in 
in roadways because the crews are bigger, the machines are smaller. When you're doing bike lane, I shouldn't say the crews are bigger, but the ratio of human to machine is much higher when you're doing a sidewalk or a bike lane than when you're doing a, a highway. Um, and, you know, Portland, I read an amazing statistic. Portland, you know, as a country in the 50s, half of us walked to school. In the 60s, half of us walked to school. Now 15% of us walk to school. In Portland, as recently as 10 years ago, 10% of kids walked to school. Now 43 walked or biked. Now 43% of the kids in Portland walk or bike to school. That is astounding. And it was accomplished through investment and good planning. So, you know, the incentives are how do you incentivize your leaders <laughs> to spend the money, not how do you get people to do it. Uh, many in our community believe there's a lack of parking when in reality there is ample parking. Uh, any suggestions on combating the, the kind of errant perception? Well, Don Shoup would say if you price it right, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> and, and also, um, wayfinding is another part of that discussion. So when you have peripheral lots um, of significant scale, you use signage to direct drivers to them. All right. Um, question from Xenia. Is there any way some of us smaller cities could pool resources and have you come help us with our walkability issues as a group? Uh, absolutely. And um, I've helped a lot of small cities like, for example, Waterloo, Iowa, very small city. Uh, I went to Hamilton, Ohio to give a talk, but I ended up giving them some advice there as well. Um, you know, for me, well, I, I guess the best thing to do would be to start a conversation. I'm happy to give out my email address. It's jeff at jeffspeck.com, J-E-F-F -F at J-E-F-F-S-P-E-C-K.com. And um, I could talk, happy to talk about that. Great. Uh, and it looks like our final one. Um, Ohio has many weak market cities and towns. Do you have suggestions for communities where new development is difficult to come by? Well, I think, um, you know, new development may not be what you want, <laughs> of course. <clears throat> Reinvestment in your main street is probably what you want and probably what, you're, what you mean to say. Um, <clears throat> there, again, I think the urban triage argument is a strong one and you know there are places I've been to places where design isn't going to make a difference you know I've been to places where there's just so little economic activity and so little opportunity for economic activity that it doesn't matter what you do and if those places try to hire me which they haven't yet I wouldn't take the job because you know some places there's no reason for them to grow and there's no energy and that's sad and it's a function of larger you know, regional and national pressures that many of us are working to change, but it's a fact. And so, you know, you have to be realistic about whether there's an opportunity for growth. But if there's any opportunity for any growth, even the slightest amount, um, the idea of picking your best intersection, you know, your 100% corner, your one place where you have the fewest missing teeth, and to invest there first with an understanding that you're place making, you know, that you're creating the place that will make the reputation of your place, um, that's the most effective way to spend your money. Right. Well, excellent. And, and you know, to, to dovetail that, I think one of the things that, uh, that I you know, sort of gleaned from your book it, when it comes to questions like that is, you know, it's not so expensive to make your downtown more pedestrian friendly and, and that I oftentimes that's sort of the, the best investment. That's going to be one of the you know easier ways to, to grow and to develop is just simply making it more friendly for the people that live nearby. So I certainly uh, appreciate uh, um, that insight. And, and uh, thanks so much, Jeff, for, for uh, being with us today, uh, for, for taking the time to answer all these questions. Uh, certainly appreciate it. Yeah, well, one last point on that, on that point. You know, in Cedar Rapids, every, every, every turn, every stoplight, Costs one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and they're all up to be replaced pretty soon, and we're getting rid of eleven of them. So there's free money that was going to be spent that we can now use to restripe and resignal, right? So or basically to restripe and put stop signs up. 
So there's money that's being spent that's probably making your city worse that could be spent to make your city better. Right. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for your attendance today. Thank you so much, Jeff, for, for um, um, you know, agreeing to um, host the webinar. I uh, just want to remind everybody that our next webinar will take place on February 19th at 1 p.m. Uh, the topic is Ohio's Economic Impact Model for Historic Tax Credits uh, with Nathaniel Kalin and John McCluskey. Uh, Nathaniel with the Ohio Preservation Tax Credit Program, and John McCluskey is a, a tax anal uh, analyst for the Ohio Development Services Agency. <clears throat> and they'll be discussing the economic modeling and application and scoring process for Ohio's historic tax credit. So, again, thank you all for joining us today. Thanks for the great questions, and thanks for supporting Heritage Ohio. And thanks, Jeff Speck. Everybody have a, a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.